Cool. Ah, uh, good evening, everyone. How are we today? Um, look, we've got a really special webinar today: AI and driverless cars. Um, with Peter O'Gorman from BICG. This should be exciting today. Um, look, in this session, we'll gain some insights into the role of data, privacy, and geographical analysis of future landscapes of, of driverless technology. Um, as always, guys, use your Q&A to answer, ask any questions for the speaker or anything you want to know. Um, use the chat to just talk amongst yourself, but pay attention to the content. And um, yeah, over to you, Peter. I think this is going to be very exciting for everyone. Good stuff. Thanks, Ross. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today. Uh, I fully anticipated to be in Brisbane with Ross. Uh, however, I'm in Darwin this week in the top of Australia and uh, very, very happy to uh, be presenting today. Thanks, uh, So uh, originally we were presenting on the topic of drones and drone data. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, we... We had to postpone that and I thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, talk about driverless cars. Uh, this is a topic that has been uh, coming up a lot in the media uh, of late. So as, as late as this month or, and uh, is we've, we've seen uh, press releases in Australia about the introduction of driverless cars. Uh, for a couple of years now, there has been a lot of uh, talk in the media about uh, the social impacts for driverless cars, um, data privacy, and uh, today we're going to do a uh, an overview of driverless cars and what they mean for society. Why are we interested in driverless cars? Um, and we're going to look at a an example of data that demonstrates uh, road accidents. And because when we talk about uh, driverless cars, we talk about safety. And when people say driverless cars are safer than uh, cars driven by you and I, um, how do we compare um, those safety figures? So we look at current safety data and we look at the issues in accessing uh, safety data in driverless cars. Yeah. Uh, so today we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be visualizing data using maps, using a common uh, analytics tool called Power BI. And I'm going to get started with uh, a presentation on driverless cars. Driverless cars are changed for the better. Can anyone think of uh, why driverless cars might be safer than cars driven by you and I? In the in the comment common area, yeah. So, if you're looking at the screen there, you might see a, a lady in a red dress uh, putting on her lipstick. Oh, I can't quite see that. Sorry, Peter, is that? Oh, you sorry. Show? Let me. Uh, the can you, uh, what can you see there, Ross? Um, just see you, mate. It's all about you. All right, so if I say share screen. Yep. And right. Perfect. How's that? Yep. And then just find your presentation. Great. Perfect. Um, so uh, as you can see there on the screen, we have uh, some examples of uh, the safety issues that are presented when you and I drive a car and the reasons why uh, driverless cars are considered to be safer uh, than, than cars driven by you and I. So as you can see there, uh, you'll see on the right, there's a lady with a red dress putting on her lipstick and uh, statistics show that 95% of accidents are due to uh, ladies in red dresses putting on their lipstick. I bet you didn't know that fact, right? Is that uh, really? That's not that's not actually true, but uh, if you can see a uh, picture over there of, of a uh, uh, an entertainment unit and a, and a disc popping out, um, yeah. and you know there's a tired eye, um, so there's lots of different factors uh, that mean that you know a car driven by you and I is not as safe as as one driven by a driverless car. 
Um, this is another example. This is, I'm probably the worst offender of this, is eating a McDonald's burger uh, while I'm driving. Um, so driverless cars don't eat at the wheel. Um, they don't live fast and die young. And, you know, they don't keep their mothers up at night worrying about where they are and whether they're safe. Um, texting whilst driving, I mean, you know, uh, that's... Uh, that's that's probably a big a big issue, um, and has been since the release of smartphones. Um, so driverless cars, as you can see, um, aren't susceptible to these uh, common everyday things where basically um, you and I are trying to do more with less, and and basically um, eating and and texting at the wheel. Mm. If we can look at uh, this screen here, what we can see here is that um, aside from safety, driverless uh, car benefits go uh, way beyond into society. Um, and we look at things like uh, problem of transit time. So when I look at, uh, when someone asks me about a lifestyle, what my lifestyle is, um, I define lifestyle as how long it takes you to get to work. So um, the transit time for how long it takes you to travel to work each day, um, that can determine, you know, your lifestyle. And so someone that lives in the Philippines and takes them three hours to get to work each day versus someone that lives in Darwin and takes 10 minutes, to me, living in Darwin is a, is a better lifestyle than maybe living in the Philippines. Um, driverless cars uh, can improve traffic flow um, by reducing um, congestion. Um, we can see there the cost and injury of uh, and the loss of life. So when we talk about making vehicles safer, it costs the government, uh, you know, $5,000 for every admission into hospital uh, on average. So the safety systems and, and the AI systems in driverless cars um, go towards eliminate, eliminating accidents caused by driver error. Um, in terms of... Uh, eliminating congestion, um, driverless cars will reduce uh, the distances between cars. So in a way, um, it's kind of like a, uh, an interesting statement, that one, because whilst we'll decrease uh, congestion, we're actually going to be able to fit more cars on the road because driverless cars can compress into the lanes um, a lot more and be, be a lot more efficient. Um, waste and underutilization. So the average car actually gets utilized only 4% of the time. So uh, driverless cars promote more of a shared society, just like uh, services such as Uber have been promoting, um, you know, use of shared resources. So if you imagine that we don't necessarily need a car anymore because we can just access it whenever we want, that's um, promoting a shared society and reducing, uh, reducing waste. Um, scarce city space. So, uh, you know, in, in cities such as uh, Sydney and Brisbane, uh, office space is becoming more rare. Parking is very expensive. So um, if you don't own a car, there's no need to park. So it eliminates the need for, for car parks. Um, what do we do with the car parks? Uh, if we don't need them, they can be reused for, uh, you know, office space or um, childcare centres or, you know, or whatever. Uh, the cost of maintaining roads projects and expanding roads. So um, highways don't need to be as wide. Therefore, you know, that should have a financial impact on um, governments who have to maintain uh, road infrastructure to uh, keep up with demand. Um, pollution. So driverless cars are naturally electric. Um, so coupled with that reduced footprint uh, of, of roads. Uh, driverless cars are creating more of a more of a lifestyle of you know eating and shopping districts around roadways that were previously noisy and um, polluted. Um, aging population. This is an interesting one. So um, um, elderly, uh, particularly you know when they get uh, slow and and tired, um, need help to go out and do their shopping on the weekend. So often need the assistance of. Uh, of, a, of a carer to pick them up and drive them out and get their, their groceries or, or, or go and see the, the waves at the beach. 
And so driverless cars remove that dependency on, on a, I guess, a human being to be able to uh, take them out. So I think, you know, I see driverless cars as is opening up the lifestyle of the elderly so they're not so dependent on uh, on their son or, or daughter to take them take them out. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot more benefits other than just uh, safety to consider. Ross, uh, those questions, uh, because I'm in full screen, uh, I'm not seeing the chats. Is there okay, any? Yeah. No, no questions are yet. Okay. But, but, okay. Yeah, just feel free to send questions through the Q&A, everyone. Yeah. yeah no worries. Uh, yeah, I'll keep an eye on that for you. So now I'm going to jump back into this. Okay. All right. So these are, when we talk about driverless cars, these are some of the leading uh, manufacturers uh, in the driverless car industry. Um, Google is the first one. So Google don't necessarily make their own cars, but um, Toyota work in conjunction with Google uh, to provide a, a driverless car. Uh, Tesla uh, are certainly one of the most uh, most talked about in the driverless car industry and very, very nice, sleek um, um, vehicle that was actually born, uh, you know, in, in the driverless car market as opposed to manufacturers like Audi, BMW and Toyota who um, who started out as traditional cars and are basically adding driverless car functionality. Uh, very, very interesting is uh, you'll see the logo for NVIDIA and anyone that is in a in the game industry and has an NVIDIA video card in their uh, laptop will know that um, NVIDIA has been historically associated with gaming, but they're in fact one of the leading um, AI companies in the world. And that is because their uh, their GPUs are being used in driverless car technology. So all of the, the data that driverless cars uh, collect through their sensors, um, that's all going into an AI brain, which is powered by an NVIDIA um, GPU and software. So um, I interesting to see um, that, that logo there. And ultimately, uh, all of these manufacturers are racing each other to be the first um, to bring a driverless car to the market that, that will suit the masses in all sorts of situations. Um, we'll talk a little bit about data now and, and privacy. So uh, driverless cars uh, are said to be safer than the cars that you and I drive. So uh, when people say they're safer, I guess, uh, how do we prove that? Uh, we need to collect the data and uh, it takes for any any sort of safety measurement, it takes a long period of um, collection of data. Uh, we're talking about the airline industry or um, we're talking about bringing a product or a medicine onto the market. Those sorts of things take um, hours and days and people um, over a period of time to actually prove uh, whether it's safe or not. So in the case of driverless cars, um, it's going to take billions of miles potentially and millions of hours to get um, any level of ex uh, record of, of safety. Yeah. So to date, uh, driverless cars have logged over a million miles and there's varying statistics out there to say, uh, you know, how much safety data is out there, but this is just one of the statistics that I pulled up. So out of the million miles uh, logged on the roads, uh, there's been only 17 accidents and just one of those has been uh, or the majority of those have been the result of human error. Uh, when we start talking about safety and whether driverless cars are safer than uh, the cars that you and I drive, uh, we need to compare apples with apples. So you can see on the left there, um, we look at the various uh, attributes that describe uh, driver data versus uh, driverless data. So from the top there, we can see that, uh, for, uh, for example, scheduled maintenance is something that you and I um, control ourselves. So we we take to the, the car to the mechanic when the wheels start squeaking or when it's on a scheduled um, kilometre interval. So it's our responsibility to take that uh, to, to get service. Whereas uh, driverless cars um, being computer driven, 
can detect the amount of kilometres that they've travelled or can, can detect um, areas needing maintenance and can drive themselves uh, to be maintained. Um, driver, driver data is quite open, so most government uh, departments will have um, road accident data available through uh, open data portals. And driverless data is quite scarce, so it's, I wouldn't say it's uh, that open at all. So here's, here's a good question actually. Um, is the car safe when suddenly on a high speed there is a flat tire? When suddenly there is a flat tire? Um, I guess the, uh, in answer to that one, um, there is no guarantee that you're absolutely 100% safe in a driverless car. So the reality is that people are still going to uh, get killed or injured in a driverless car. Uh, but the reality is that the uh, the chance of that happening is far less than if it was a car driven by uh, someone who's distracted eating their hamburger, who's texting their girlfriend at the same time. Yeah. So, um, so yes, um, you know, um, but what we need to realise is driverless cars um, have an extreme amount of safety systems on board. Um, they're not susceptible to the usual uh, distractions that you and I might face. And, you uh, you know, uh, braking is a huge part of uh, the safety of those um, systems and the ability to apply the braking and to sense um, situations where they need to apply the brakes before you and I would sense um, that situation. Yeah. Much quicker. Right. And do, do, there's another question that, that's related. Do cars connect to a network? Do cars connect to a network? Well, so, yes. Um, so driverless cars do utilize cloud-based services. So sending data to the cloud, they're receiving data from the cloud. Um, yep. So yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great a great one. The missus won't say that you're driving bad. And that's uh, particularly the case for myself. Uh, my wife won't uh, actually let me drive anymore because she says I'm such a bad driver. So <laughs> <laughs> I get that too, don't worry. And um, uh, here's another one. Sorry it, it, to stop the presentation, but they're all in that same same area if you don't mind yeah. so asking that if the signals go down for some reason in the traffic your traffic signals and those sorts of things how does it figure it out uh great question i mean uh obviously uh cars uh, driverless cars are electric and they're and as a result they're relying on um you know electric power and current and you know network so yes i mean but we're probably not going to go go into that today in a great yeah. deal of detail. However, um, Ross did mention uh, earlier that there will be a a, a deep dive into driverless car um, technology in next month or in yeah, twelfth of September. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're going to do the tech side a bit yep. more. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I guess keep going, mate? sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, the great great questions, guys. So I guess what I'm just trying to highlight here is that um, it's very very difficult to compare. Um, data um, from driver vehicles to driverless, and that is because of the nature of uh, what that data is. So uh, when I say it's open versus not open, um, we don't have readily ac ready access to driverless car data just yet, yeah. uh, but it's, it's a big issue, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, driver data is quite summarised and small, whereas uh, driverless data is very, very large. We're talking... Uh, about four terabytes um, every hour. Um, driver data is typically rolled up by and aggregated by age, gen gender, and other attributes such as you know indigenous type. Uh, whereas you know driverless car doesn't have those attributes, so there's some things we won't be able to compare. Um, driver data has a high latency, so typically uh, road accidents might. Uh, appear on an open data website perhaps a year after the accident has happened. Um, driverless car data has a very low latency, so it happens in real time. Um, you know, driver driverless car data is probably questionably. Um, I, I'm not going to go into whether um, it's more hackable or not than say a public data website. However, it's probably more hack desirable, as in uh, desirable for a hacker to. Um, fiddle with the records or fiddle with the systems on board uh, a driverless car versus actually hacking an open data site. Yeah. So there's there's quite a few differences there. And when we talk about um, are 
driverless cars safer, we uh, there's a few few other issues we need to consider. So uh, we can see um, up here we have uh, in Australia and and Ross um, you might want to throw up a uh, a poll question. Uh, yeah. This poll question there. Yeah. So what do you think is the greatest benefits? I'll launch it first, hey? Uh, what do you think is the greatest benefits of a driverless car? And, and we'll just give the audience there some time to answer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I heard a recent, um, I, I read a recent article, sorry, in the paper in regards to um, a, a chip manufacturer uh, of driverless cars and it was with the, the navigation system and they took 100% responsibility for any accidents. Yep. Yeah, and I, yeah I'm hear, I hear at the moment, are you, are you seeing a lot of um, ethical and, and uh, I suppose governance questions around this technology and the development of it? Yeah, absolutely. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to look at some of the, you know, the technology is actually here. Yeah. And reality is that the legislation and the governance and the privacy hasn't been fleshed out yet. So yeah, there's yeah. Some, some really interesting um, developments happening in Australia in, in that in the development of those uh, types of things yeah. that need to happen before we, we, we get those sort of, you know driverless cars in. Yeah. All right, yeah. so, um, so let's, let's launch it. So I'll share the results with everyone. All right. Interesting that uh, nobody has mentioned uh, number five, faster zero to 100 acceleration. I, I thought that's probably the best feature of a driverless car. Um, I rode a motorbike, mate, so I don't need acceleration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, that's, great. that's great, guys. I mean, that's, uh, it's just nice to see where everyone's headspace is at. Hmm. We'll have another one shortly too. Go for it. Is there a standard for building driverless cars like a framework? Um, mm. uh, good question. Um, yes, there is a standard type of system, which I'm going to uh, show you in a sec. And driverless cars can reduce the distance between. During the raining, how can we show we keep safe distance? Yeah, look, I mean, if it's raining, um, the distance between the cars will be... Um, you know, dynamically altered by the AI engine, depending, you know, the sensors um, will pick up the distance between the car, but um, other factors such as uh, weather will also be sensed, which I'll go through mm. in a sec as well. Cool, thanks. Some great questions, guys. So, um, all right, probably uh, go through uh, three examples of uh, driverless cars in Australia. So uh, we've got... Uh, Darwin, Sydney, and Brisbane. Okay, so in Darwin, so I'm in Darwin at the moment, and uh, my colleague Colin here uh, was just actually just telling me that there is a driverless car in the uh, city, uh, travelling around one of the more popular tourist spots, um, and this is what it looks like here. It looks a little bit like a um, ice cream van, uh, and that's been here for the last six months. Uh, in a very limited capacity, you can see it's moving people from a very um, short distance from one to the other. But it was the first trial uh, of a driverless car in Australia, and it's um, I think it's I think it's great to see. Um, there's a trial in New South Wales. So you can see uh, this article was only dated um, earlier this month. Um, so there's a trial happening uh, in New South Wales to test uh, the safety figures. So again, a fairly limited, um, a limited test period, but essentially what they're doing is uh, you can see uh, they're testing how technology could be used one day on the road. So it's a, it's a proof of concept to kind of like flush out the surrounding issues of that might come up with um, driverless cars. Uh, this, is a, this is a great one. This is in Ipswich in Brisbane. So um, there's a 20 something million dollar project um, and what this is, uh, what we we're talking about earlier about government policy and le legislation. This is actually a project, uh, not so much to do with the safety, but more to flush out that policy and le legislation that needs to happen. Uh, so we've got a question here: Will cars communicate to each other? 
Is there an ethical issue if encountering traffic incidents? And some other questions. All right, I might answer those at, uh, just at the end, guys, and because I'm going to show you some, uh, I'm going to talk through some of these data issues. Okay, so an important factor is, uh, is whether the public sector will be proactive in taking advantage of driverless cars or not. Uh, so we can see three examples where the public sector um, are actually being very proactive in actually trialling uh, driverless cars for real. And, you know, that is the primary most important factor and I think it's great, great to see. Um, the other important factor is actually um, sharing the data. So when we talk about sharing data, we talk about um, the type of data, who's going to, you know, who we're sharing data between and, and what. Um, when we talk about uh, driverless car data, we talk about um, standardising or normalising data so uh, that any person in any industry can use that data. And a, a good example is um, the airline industry, which standardised data for um, safety so that no matter which airline, um, they could actually um, collect safety data. So that whole system took collaboration between government and industry about 25 years. So it's, it's not a small thing. Um, um, driverless cars will be optional by 2024 and are said to be mandatory by 2044. Those lead times are not just, you know, technology playing catch up. This is more about um, legislation. Um, so we can see that in an equal partnership between government and, is, in, and industry, um, we have a breakthrough. So, um, and we can see that's happening now. So we've got Tesla um, actually uh, funding a project with the Ipswich uh, Council, the government. And so uh, now that we've got these trials, now we've got um, potentially in a limited capacity, we've got access to data. And now we, now we need to consider, you know, with that data, how do we process that data uh, where do we store it? Um, how, how do we make sure it's secure? What tools do we use and what sort of insights are we interested in? Now to do, uh, regarding the questions about um, data, what I'm going to do is just go through a very, very quick data ecosystem to highlight uh, how we might consume that data from the driverless cars. So, uh, in any uh, data organisation, we're consuming data from our CRMs or our finance system or our sales system. And those uh, down the bottom there, they're our uh, systems that will sit inside our organisation. Um, over on the top left there, you can see uh, we've had um, cloud-based data sources. Um, you know, organisations are moving their, their databases into the cloud more and more um, often. And essentially, when we talk about driverless cars, um, that data is also in the cloud. So it obviously initiates in the car um, via the sensors, and but that data is um, is actually sitting in a repository in the cloud. Uh, once it's in the cloud, uh, you can see in the middle there, we use um, analytics um, services, and, and I've given the example of Power BI, and that gives us the ability to consume the data in a in a space where we're able to apply, you know, um, a huge amount of processing power and a huge, huge amount of uh, functionality to interpret and analyze that data. Now, this is, uh, we talk about the, how the data is actually produced. So I'm not gonna go into a great deal of uh, detail about this today. However, uh, in the session next month, um, I expect this is gonna be covered in a lot more detail. But you can see there's uh, various components that uh, actually produce data. So we have a, a processor, uh, we've got uh, laser sensors, um, radar, uh, an orientation sensor. Now this is just an example of a few of the sensors. There's a wheel hub sensor, but the reality is there's hundreds of different sensors actually all working um, at, at the same time on the car. And each of those is producing data. So um, one car is producing about four terabytes of data per day, and that's just with the, uh, about an hour of driving. Uh, so we look at that sort of volume and, and where do we store that? And we saw the diagram earlier showing, you know, typical data ecosystem. 
um, if we if we put that data in the into the cloud, there's a number of different uh, data sources that would most suit um, driverless car data. Um, so if anyone's ever familiar with uh, Microsoft ecosystem, we've got uh, different types of Microsoft uh, cloud databases depending on how much data you have. And typically uh, that will suit uh, low to high volume um, data traffic. Um, there's a lot of open source uh, type data storage um, available in the cloud also. So we've got a um, Hadoop based, based systems, um, graph databases, and um, Elasticsearch, which is a, uh, is a technology invented by a gentleman who wanted a recipe, a means of storing his wife's recipes, which grew into a, um, a massive uh, storage system for storing, you know, highly, uh, highly raw log based and, and sensor based data. All right, so what we'll do now is, uh, now assuming we have the driverless car data, um, we would then be able to pull that into a um, analytic tool and actually uh, look at things like, um, I'm gonna talk specifically about vehicle accidents, but potentially we can look at, um, we can analyze any, any of that sensor data. But if we look specifically at the issue of safety, we'll look at um, road accident data, and I'm gonna show you a couple of different maps and how they work. And that'll give you a little bit of insight into how we, get, how we could analyze um, driverless car data. So I'm going to switch to my Power BI tool. Now these are, uh, this is road accident data for uh, Queensland, so Queensland government and it's for the periods uh, 2002 to 2016. Um, now I've pulled this data off a government website, which I'm happy to provide, uh, but yeah, any of you can actually go and download this data. Um, what we've got here is essentially a couple of different slides which tell um, a, a story. So uh, each of these is a essentially a dashboard page. And I'm going to go through and, and explain um, what what these what these dashboards are telling us from the raw data. So here um, we can see in 2011 we had a significant drop in the number of vehicle accidents involving cars, whilst the amount of casualties remained uh, basically uh, constant. Now that to me shows me that uh, that that's a little bit odd, right? So. This, when I looked at this data, it raised concerns about the accuracy of open data for um, road accidents. And there's nothing to say that that data or that open data is actually accurate. Um, and this is one of the issues uh, that we'll come across when we compare safety data between driver and driverless car data is potentially some of this data isn't, isn't clean. So that, that was an interesting uh, anomaly. Uh, this one here, and I'm not sure what's happened with that one. I'm going to remove that. Uh, but this one here is showing that uh, it's analysing data by season. So in the bottom axis, you can see the seasons, uh, autumn, spring, summer and winter. And we can see the um, hour of day. So you can see here roughly that, uh, you know, 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. are kind of like the peak uh, peak times for accidents. So... Essentially, the screen is telling you that the peak times um, are 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. roughly, and that tends to follow the season. Although you can see in summer, there's slightly less accidents at 3 p.m. Um, this is an interesting one. So you are more likely to be involved in a multi-vehicle multi accident on a Friday in a 60 kilometer per hour zone. So you can see uh, how we've used different visualizations to show the number of accidents by day of week. And then over here, we can actually see the type or the uh, type of accident. So uh, multi-vehicle accident versus single vehicle versus hit pedestrian. So uh, don't go out on a Friday. That's a, probably a good one for you, Ross. Um, oh, yeah. I know it, don't worry about that. <laughs> Get too old. Uh, 
this one is this one is a little bit more uh, sinister. It's looking at um, not just accidents but fatalities, mm. and it's analysing uh, the number of fatalities by um, gender. So, what it's telling us is uh, fatalities involving male drivers are on the increase, and the highest concentration is in uh, central and more recently north uh, Queen, Queensland. Uh, this one I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So we're starting to now look at geographic based maps uh, rather than, you know, what we've seen in these screens has been more um, column based or tabular based charts. So looking at maps is a lot more interesting and tells, you know, a far greater story. It's like a picture is a thousand words. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is just showing the number of accidents spread over a geographic region and um, on the right here, if I just expand, um, this is a an example of an Esri map. So uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what this is, but what the, what the screen is actually telling us is uh, most fatalities in the Wide Bay region were single vehicle accidents in a speed zone of 100 to 110. Um, this is another interesting one, which we'll go through in a sec. So this is showing that uh, the number of fatalities in Brisbane West um, overlaid with data from Esri, which is not data that we've collected, it's data that uh, other people have published. So we're merging two data sets together to tell a story. And what we can see here is the fatality zones um, in relation to the proximity of schools. So you can see the five, 10 and 15 kilometer radius from schools um, using the shading. Now, I'll just show you, uh, there's some other, other ways that we can actually uh, represent data geographically, uh, but there's some, there's some issues and traps uh, with doing that. So here I've got a list of uh, postcodes with the number of accidents. And in Power BI and every other analytics tool, there's quite a number of ways of actually visualizing um, data. Okay, so here we've picked up all of the postcodes in our, in our database or in our open data for um, Queensland. As you can see, it doesn't look quite right because we've actually, it's uh, picked up the postcode and it's actually picked up postcodes in New Zealand and uh, Philippines and Europe. So that's not quite right. So we've got to be careful when we're analyzing data to, um, uh, when we're using postcodes in particular with some of these types of uh, mapping visualizations. Uh, if I switch to some of the other visuals, this is a globe map. So this is a more of a 3D style map. You can see I can spin, spin the globe around. Um, here is some of the accident data, which is, which is correct. I'll zoom in. Okay. So we can visualize the data through the height of the bar. But again, uh, if we zoom back out, all right, we can see that it's again picked up postcodes in other parts of the world. So um, some of these uh, types of mapping visuals need a little bit more information uh, for us to be able to paint an accurate picture um, using a map. And uh, at the moment, so the Esri um, is, is one way to actually more accurately define uh, the location of the of the accident. Now we're looking at driver data here. So driverless car data would be exactly the same. We have a, um, but typically a driverless car data would, would have a greater degree of accuracy in terms of um, latitude and a longitude and perhaps um, even an altitude. So what I'll just do here is show you one way that um, Esri supports uh, more accurate I'm going to pop into this one. Okay. Okay. What we can do here is under the location type is uh, the Esri actually allows us to define the country in focus. So uh, where the other mappings uh, pretty much uh, didn't allow us to do that and, and instantly scattered the postcodes across the globe. This one actually gives us the choice whether it's many countries or one country. 
And so focusing the data on one country um, gives us a, for straight off the bat, gives us a more accurate uh, reading. Um, I'm just going to go and show you some of the other uh, advantages of using more, a more advanced uh, visualization tools such as Esri. So we can change the, the canvas um, easily. So you can see we've got a, a street map view or, um, or streets or uh, light or dark canvas. Okay, uh, we've looked at the location type. Um, we can actually go in and uh, change the theme of the map. So we can go from uh, location-based points. Um, heat maps are quite popular. They look really good. Um, bubbles, um, color, size and color, clustering. Um, we can customize the points and the colors. So you can see there with a heat map, we can actually um, start adjusting the transparency or the area of influence. Um, and we can even adjust the color, the color ramp. Uh, this is a really interesting one. So um, in this analytics pane, so this gives us the ability to drop pins. So we can look for um, certain locations. You can see it's actually picked up a pin there and I can you see it's put the pin on the spot so we can start putting in relative um, locations um, drive time so what this is is the ability to show um, either the distance in kilometers or the dis or the time in minutes so here we can say show me the drive time in minutes from the location so I could say 10 minutes for example or I can say, um, tell me within the radius of 10 miles, and it'll give me basically a visual based on those locations. It's going to give me a, an impression of uh, what that looks like. Um, this is this is a really, really interesting part. We start talking about um, analysis of data is we can start overlaying open data or public data, not just road accidents, but we can overlay uh, population statistics. So here we've got, um, uh, total population or population by gender, um, household density, um, age. Uh, we can look at income. So we can start um, better understanding our accident data by actually overlaying um, data for the region. So tell me how many accidents occurred uh, in an area where household income was X, you know. So we select that one up or come on my card and you can see that there. Now, um, some of the issues with open data at the moment and being able to bring in and, and blend open data with our accident data is most of this is actually only in the US at the moment. So what we're seeing is, you know, in the next uh, couple of years, there's going to be an explosion of uh, these tools being able to mesh in um, data um, that we typically find in a census or in an open data website, they'll become more available in tools like this. All right. Um, oh, sorry. Un sorry. Un unmute. Um, quite a few questions here tonight. All right. Let me just uh, let me just have a scan through those. I've lost my questions. Right. Here we go. I Q and A. Okay. Lots of good ones. Yep. Um, so look, there's a few questions about um, the software and, uh, you know, need for car insurance. Interesting, um, I did see someone the other day advertising for um, driverless car insurance. So uh, as, a, as a special type of insurance. So people are already providing that service in Australia, um, getting ready for the boom. 
Um, what should a driverless car do if facing a choice between putting a passenger at risk or someone else outside it? Um, you know, look, um, the context of the driverless car system means that it's uh, firstly uh, collecting data through a variety of sensors. Uh, now, that's just boring old data that's sitting in a storage bank, so it's up to the artificial intelligence engine to actually make that uh, determination. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about um, the ability to make a decision, but um, not just that, the ability to make a decision where you don't necessarily know certain things. So um, when we talk about a decision such as, uh, you know, putting a passenger at risk or someone outside, really that's going to come down to, um, you know, that, that, split decision which it's going to use uh, with it with its AI brain and and essentially um, yeah I mean that's a great it's a great question but ultimately what what AI is is the ability for a machine to make that decision and, and not us so um, driverless car system a whole system uh, you know, the driverless, the real driverless car or the whole system need a great update for the traffic system. Does it difficult to operate? Um, so Tesla actually make a uh, driverless car that is, and, and the real goal for, for these guys is to make a, um, at the moment, they're making cars that you can drive and then if you take your hand off the steering wheel, um, it'll take over. So that's more of a hybrid style car, whereas... Um, you know, some of the cars, and we're talking cars of the future, is that you won't necessarily have the ability to actually uh, put your hand on the steering wheel. Uh, a lot of the cars that are being tested now, um, if if they don't have a steering wheel, um, there's usually two operators inside the car. So engineers are actually sitting in the car through the duration of testing, making observations, all that sort of thing. Uh, is the software for controlling functions built into the car or controlled by a service provider? So at the moment, um, the car company is working in conjunction with vendors. So um, as I mentioned, Audi uh, works with NVIDIA. So um, those guys have teamed up. So usually it's a combination of um, different vendors teaming up to provide the one entire system. Um, Audi providing the uh, essentially the uh, vehicle technology and NVIDIA providing the, the processing and the artificial intelligence to, to consume that data. Um, how driverless car manages in case of fire or electric spark or hailstorm? That's a great question. Maybe that's a good one for the, our topic next month, Ross. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have a look at that one, yeah. Thanks yeah. for that. Um, same with the weather conditions um, and, and sensors and things like that. Um, average life of a driverless car, that's that's a really good one. So, um, yeah, that's uh, I guess that's the result of, uh, you know, real real testing is, um, but typically, uh, you know, a car these days, you know, after it's three or four years old, becomes a used car. And so what we're seeing today is actually, you know, more and more cars being used on a, for a very, very limited time span. Um, that might be a great question for uh, for next month as well. Um, zero to 100 acceleration. If the car is too fast, how can you make sure the sensor can respond quickly? Um, yeah, I guess the zero to 100 acceleration, um, you know, if you and I were to drive a Tesla, we're, we've got the ability to plant the pedal and, and go that fast, but a driverless car is not necessarily going to make that decision. So, um, yes, if... Uh, I'm sure there's um, safety limits that would govern, you know, how how much is too fast. But in a driverless car, it's not uh, not tempted by you know the need for speed as as much as you or I. Is a five G network essential to a driverless car? Um, good question. But if we look at the data throughput, so if we say four terabytes in one hour, um, typically, uh, you know, my uh, my phone or my uh, uh, USB hard drive uh, takes hours to upload, um, say, a 50 gigabyte file into the cloud. So, you know, um, four, four terabytes is huge. So, uh, you know, 
not all data will be uploaded in real time into the cloud, usually just um, very, very specific alert-based information that needs to be real time would be sent into the cloud through APIs. Um, the majority of uh, sensor data would probably reside in a, in a bank and then be uploaded when it, when it docks. Um, so these this, are all, if, if, the sorry, driver, uh, if the driverless data is, is not open, so how can we pull the data to Power BI? Who owns the data then? And is the data logged in some sort of repository at all? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, at the moment, look, we don't have access to any of the driverless car data. Uh, but if we actually look into Power BI and, and how we actually access data, you can see there's quite a number of different data sources um, supported. So some of these are fairly industry standard um, database uh, adapters and others are, are cloud-based um, and others are more vendor specific so for example Google Analytics or Salesforce um, github you know QuickBooks all of these are vendor based services that require us to log in um, so for example if you guys are using uh, Zendesk um, I can't just go and connect to that I actually need to provide some credentials Okay, so we've got, to, we've got to provide a URL and then we actually have to provide a login to access that URL. So um, in any case, you know, the, the data needs to be authenticated. Um, the data needs to be encrypted in storage and in transit. And that's what these um, data uh, services provide is that standard level of encryption. Um, now, whether or not driverless car companies make that available to uh, data junkies uh, like myself, that um, remains to be seen. However, uh, first, uh, first priority is for insurance companies to get access to the data. Um, government, you know, car companies, they all need access to the same data, essentially. So um, that all has to be sorted out. So, you know, the trial that's happening in Ipswich in Queensland, uh, through the period of the next couple of years, they'll be using these cars and actually coming up with a, a framework for how to share that data and consume that data. And you know the car companies are really, really keen to actually make that happen. They realise that uh, the advances in technology um, is not the only sole uh, uh, thing that needs to happen for for these driverless cars to get into our community. It it really comes down to how how we're going to share that data. Do, do you know of a country that's booming at the moment with driverless cars? Or is it all still in that uh, discovery ethics kind of? You know, how do we bring it to market phase? Yeah, I'll just actually um, pull up another pull up another deck. There is quite an interesting history to show you um, some of the advances in in different countries. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, some some countries are actually. Uh, making it, uh, putting a date uh, that it'll be mandatory. Um, mm. So I'll actually just pick up this uh, slide. This one here, so. Uh, so we can see here uh, some examples. So in 2011, um, US, um, permitting the operation of autonomous cars in Nevada. Um, so Nevada has been uh, very, very uh, on the front foot. Uh, Florida in 2012. Um, California was the third. Um, uh, Europe, Germany, Netherlands and Spain have allowed testing. Uh, Finland is planning on passing a law. I guess this was, these are stats written some time ago, but um, we're seeing some countries being, um, you know, quite on the front foot in regards to allowing um, driverless cars to be piloted. Australia is probably a little bit behind some of the other countries. Um, but for a government, you know, it provides um, a lot of uh, cost benefits and lifestyle benefits that are really, really attractive. Um, reducing the amount of accidents reduces the cost for and the burden for hospitals, um, you know, Reducing the amount of money spent on um, upgrading roads must be huge. Um, 
So, and you know, having people to be more productive, I mean, that's all, that's all great for an economy. So um, in Asian countries, I haven't, uh, haven't seen a lot. So for example, in the Philippines, um, traffic is absolutely chaos. So I'm expecting, um, you know, until driverless cars get to be, uh, you know, autonomous and can drive, you know, very, very defensively and aggressively as well. Um, that's going to be a challenge in some of those countries. Um, but yeah, no, great, great question, that one. Thanks, Michelle, and that was great. Got that last poll question, if you like, on, on, on when you think cars would be available. Yeah, great. Yeah, pop that I'll one just up, watch that. So just, just take the time here to, to have a little look. And when, when do you think they're going to be available? This will be interesting. Isn't it? A little bit away, hey? Yeah. So it's looking like five years is the winner. Yeah, I reckon. Uh, I reckon that's when we say available. Um, currently, we're seeing in Australia that they're only available in a very limited sense. Um, the prediction is that within five years they'll be, you know, available, um, and within uh, twenty something years they'll be mandatory. And uh, yeah, you mentioned with the ownership of a car. So when we talk about it, you know, is this dynamic? I'm trying to understand in the sense of, do you think it'll be like a, you know, like an Uber rental sort of arrangement, or would you physically go and buy a driverless car? Um, for for myself, um, you know, like the history of cars um, is been that the car has been uh, kind of like an extension to your ego. So uh, if I want to be a, someone that's seen to be a playboy millionaire, I go and buy a yellow Porsche, you know. Um, uh, if I'm not sure what they say about people that ride motorbikes, Ross, but, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lifestyle choice which, you know, usually suits your... Uh, you're in a, in a demons, you know, and it, it's um, not a Harley, mate. We'll go there. <laughs> no. And I mean, even, even for a Tesla, you know, there's a lot of young, uh, it techs who have got a bit of money who, you know, the Tesla itself is seen as a bit of a prestige thing. So again, it's kind of driven by ego, but yeah. there'll, there'll come a time where, you know, where a driverless car doesn't kind of, doesn't pump the ego, especially if it looks like an ice cream van and, you know, there's no steering wheel. <laughs> There's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Totally. So, so once once uh, essentially society doesn't see the car as a extension to the ego, that's when it it kind of becomes um, uh, a shared a shared service. So um, shared everything. So it, let's look at what's happened with uh, with Uber and with uh, Airbnb. Um, mm. Essentially, you know, people people. Um, don't have to buy um, a holiday apartment anymore or do a timeshare so they can just go and, you know, rent, rent off um, peer to peer. So same, same with Uber. So we, we think that, uh, you know, driverless cars is definitely promoting a shared society. Yeah. And uh, my, my children, you know, who are, um, you know, some of my children are only 14 years old, so they're going to get their license in two years. And I've spoken to them about this and they say, no way do we want driverless cars. We want our license, damn it. We want to go driving to the beach with our friends. So, you know, it's not for everyone, um, but it'll come a time where essentially once the, once the safety benefits and the cost benefits are like so overwhelming, yeah. then um, there's going to be less and less choice for us to be able to actually drive our own cars. Yeah. And, and I'm seeing this a lot in regards to emerging technologies. It's, Okay, we've got the governance, but the cultural shift seems to be the most challenging. You know, in, in, in when it's not just the technology that's changing and providing new opportunities, but it's that mindset and cultural shift in the way that we know we do things, and and that seems to be a, a challenge. You know, for the everyday consumer. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah. So what's the next thing to become a shared service? Um, who knows? Maybe um, maybe people won't want to get married anymore because you can just um, dial a girlfriend or, you know, I don't know. So, <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it really, it really opens up the, um, yeah. re- opens up the entire um, industry. And as far as mm. ownership, um, we talk about ownership and we talk about, you know, waste and underutilization. Um, yeah. It really opens up a shared society, not just to cars, but maybe to houses, mm. um, jobs, you know, um, um, jet skis, to, you name it. So, almost going down the old barter system. You know, taking your back of you. Hey, here's actually a really good question. Sorry, we might use this as the last one, but once the driverless car is widely used, the org or government who operates a system will be able to monitor everyone's driving. It's like a Google, right? Like schedule and destination. How do we solve the privacy issues? Um, so once the driverless car is used, um, so when we say used, are we talking about... Um, probably built up that data of usage and, you know, it's been Im- embedded in society and there's, a, there's, there's some robust data to, yeah. to kind of monitor. Yeah. I guess, I guess they will know where you have, where you have traveled to. Yeah. I mean, mm. your record of being in the vehicle, but as far as um, who operates the system, um, it would be like a car company or government. I mean, that all comes, that all comes down to the specification of the data that, um, that that the government is going to um, that framework that I spoke about, where government and industry need to work together. Yeah. So what what is what type of data needs to be shared? Um, who needs to access it? Um, and for what purpose? So that that's really driving that um, that framework and that legislation. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Look, that's fantastic. Great, look, uh, great yeah. questions, guys. I mean, yeah. uh, a lot of those questions I think you're going to find, you know, uh, in the topic next month, which is going to do a deep dive more into the, the nuts and bolts. Um, yeah. But hopefully yeah. you can sort of see that, you know, data and data sharing is something that's uh, probably just as important as any anything else in the introduction of um, driverless cars. Um, if anyone wants to look at um, Power BI and, and actually want to drive uh, some of this data yourselves. Um, you just go to powerbi.com and you can actually download the Power BI desktop uh, tool for free. Um, so you can see there, sign up for free, um, download free. And then if you want to learn about it, there's a guided learning section on the website, uh, very, very open. And if you're new to Power BI, there's a getting started section you can see the topics are all laid out five minutes four minutes all very very easy um getting data and um, really quite nice uh, tutorials with um screenshots and sometimes videos so yeah yeah do we mind if we send your presentation out is that okay? yeah that's fine i'll actually download that and uh save it save it for you there ross so yeah thanks we'll send it i just had a couple of people request it for you that'd be great yeah, excellent. Look, if there's no more questions, guys, I'd really just like to thank Peter for his time today. And I think you've opened our eyes into the bigger picture of, of where this is at the moment and where it's going and as, a, as an industry, what, what we need to do and how we need to discuss it. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, and greetings from Darwin. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for your time, Peter, and take care. Thanks, everyone, right. for attending. We look forward to seeing you on the 12th of September. Thank you. Bye-bye.